Hey everyone, how are we all doing today, this morning, this evening, depending on where you are in the world? Welcome to the Paulo's Choice Skincare live chat for the month of August 2023. We are moving these from twice a month to once a month, at least for the time being. See how that new schedule goes. And today's topic uh, is one that came from my colleague on our social media team. Uh, she wanted me to talk about or come up with a list of 10 skincare tips that are underrated. Um, so it's, what I came up with is kind of a mix of tips that I definitely feel are underrated uh, and also that I some tips that I, um, rather than being underrated per se, they're, they're under the radar, meaning that um, uh, some people know about them, some people don't. Uh, you may have heard about them once or twice, but then it's kind of in one ear or out the other. I mean, let's face it, we kind of live in an information overload society. <laughs> we can't keep everything in our heads these days. Um, so that is going to be the topic of discussion um, for this show, and I would love to have you share some of your favorite skincare tips with me and others who are watching, uh, participating in the comments section. It does not have to be, uh, Lord knows there's a treasure trove of tips in the expert advice uh, article section of the Paula's Choice website, but it does not have to be a tip you've read about from us or heard about from us. It can be you know, as long as it is a good tip, as long as it is, you know, helping skin to be healthy, to look and feel better, uh, and it doesn't even have to be a direct skincare tip as in like product related or manner of using a product related. It could just be a lifestyle or wellness type tip that you have found really makes a difference. I would love to hear about it. So um, on a um, personal note, Despite the fact that we are smack in the middle of August, and in fact, most of Europe is still on holiday, um, my son started third grade this morning. It was a bit crazy. I feel like they're starting the school year uh, a little earlier and earlier. Uh, I, I kind of long for the days when um, summer vacation actually went through August as opposed to stopping right in the middle. Um, but that is his school schedule. He didn't seem to mind. Uh, when I was his age, I think I would have gone kicking and screaming into school when it was still sunny and 75 out. Uh, and and my, my friends that went to different schools uh, didn't have to go back yet. So I definitely would have been pulling the it's not fair card back then. But he just rolls with it and uh, was actually like super excited today. We have a neighborhood tradition where all of the kids that go to this particular school meet. There's, there's the same family hosts every year. Uh, we gather in their front yard. They have coffee for the adults, juice, water, uh, donuts, and other little snacky things for the kids. And everyone just kind of meets about half an hour before school starts. Uh, and their, their group pictures are taken. And then we all walk from uh, that point over to the school because it's kind of on the edge of the neighborhood. So um, really fun. Uh, I, I thought it was really cute. About two weeks before school started, um, my son asked if we were going to be doing that again. And it just really kind of hit home how a lot of the traditions that families uh, instill and, and, and repeat, uh, just how much kids notice that type of thing and, and start looking forward to them. And, you know, they get to that age where you don't even have to bring it up anymore. They're just, they're expecting it uh, and it means something to them. And I, so I think that that's very special. So enough about that, uh, he's, he's off and running. Let's get into some of these underrated skin care tips. And uh, all right, let's see. I am going to count down from 10 to 1 and other than like the one that's in the number one position, which I, I put in the number one position deliberately because I think it is it is the most important. Um, some of you may already know what that is, but um, if you if you do just keep it under wraps. Um, but otherwise, these are not listed in descending order of importance. So. Number 10 is to try double cleansing. 
Um, I did not used to be like a super huge fan of this when I first heard about it. I'm like, really? Why can't you just find one cleanser that takes off everything? But then when we were going through the process of developing this little guy, the Omega Plus Cleansing Balm, I realized how much value double cleansing can have in certain situations. So the primary situations where double cleansing makes sense, and if you're not familiar with what it is, Double cleansing, uh, just like the name uh, states, involves using two cleansers. Typically, your first cleanser uh, is a balm or an oil of some sort, maybe a micellar water, and you use it on skin that is dry. Uh, you may or may not use it with a washcloth or some other type of uh, cleansing aid. It isn't required to do that. Some people prefer it. But that's the first step. You rinse it off. I am so sorry. I thought I silenced my phone. And then you proceed to your regular water soluble cleanser. So what the first cleanse is designed to do is really get in there and remove more tenacious facial sunscreens. Uh, I'm looking at you mineral filters. You are wonderfully protective. You are super gentle, but you are very difficult to remove. And why do you want to get all those mineral filters off? As great as they are about protecting your skin from environmental damage, including uh, the uh, pigment changes that result, the, uh, pigment changes you don't want uh, from sun exposure, they're tenacious, they cling. And that's a good thing when it comes to like having fun in the sun. But when it's time, when the sun goes down and it's time you know, to get ready for bed, you want to make sure that all of that is removed because particularly if you are prone to clogged pores leaving traces of those mineral filters behind on the skin day after day day after day is going to uh, build up and potentially if it doesn't make clogged pores worse it may end up leading to your complexion looking dull because it will literally have uh, these mineral filters have more of a matte finish on the skin. So as over time as they build up, if you're not washing them off all the way, they can actually start to dull your complexion. You'll see that you've lost that, that hydrated glow that you, you know, had four or six weeks ago. So then you follow. So the Omega Plus Complex Cleansing Balm is my, is my pick for that to get it started. Super concentrated, small amount. Use it on dry skin works wonders to remove um, those mineral-based SPFs, as well as any long-wearing or transfer-resistant type makeup that you may wear. Even if you're not wearing that type of makeup in the form of a foundation, maybe your concealer fits that bill, maybe your eyeliner fits that bill, or your mascara or your eyes. I mean, think of how many products out there today uh, because of formulary and you know, ingredient advances, advances in film forming technology, they just wear. You know, and you see it right on the pack. They're making the 12 hour, the 16 hour, the 24 hour claim. And for the most part, that they do hold up quite well. But the trade off is you have to extend some extra effort to take them off. So you've done your balm, then you pull in a product like the Calm Ultra Gentle Cleanser, my personal favorite. I love, 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 love this cleanser. Uh, so I have to promote it um, all the time because it really is awesome for everybody. Uh, and then you rinse that off with water. That is going to get more the, the accumulation of dead skin cells, uh, surface debris that accumulates underneath all that other stuff. So if the products are gentle, you will not strip or dry out your skin. Um, and of course, double cleansing would only come into play as part of your nighttime routine. In the morning, you can use whichever of the two cleansers you happen to personally like better. Hopefully you like them both, um, but it really doesn't matter which one you use in the morning in that sense. <clears throat> Number nine, give lips some love. We tend to ignore our lips until they become uncomfortably dry and flaky, but lips need special attention. The skin, lips are mucous membranes, but they are covered with a thin layer of skin. It, it is microns thinner than skin elsewhere on the face. So lips are incredibly vulnerable. Thankfully, keeping them in top shape is actually pretty easy. You can apply a lip balm with SPF during the day. Super convenient to carry around a product like our lip screen SPF 50, fragrance free, 
flavor free uh, for a lip balm with sunscreen. I this actually tastes fairly neutral. Um, it's one of my favorites, especially when I know I'm going to be outside for a long period of time. It is colorless. It does work under lipstick or gloss. <clears throat> Just bear in mind that when you're putting uh, a lip color over this balm, you are compromising its ability to protect how much we don't know. Um, but some of that is tr some of that lip screen is transferring to your lip gloss wand or the lipstick. If it's a traditional lipstick, that twist up, it's transferring to the lipstick itself. How to get around that uh, if it's not too much trouble, if you can do this without messing up the lip color itself, is um, you can put a thinner layer of the lip screen on as your base layer, lip color next, and then very lightly, almost like press and dab, a product like our lip. There's other colorless lip balms with sunscreens out there. I just happen to love this one. And in fact, uh, in June, Lip Screen won um, a Best SPF for Lips Award from the Zoe Report. So we were super excited about that because this is a product that's been out on the market for a while. Uh, it's kind of what I call one of our sleeper products in that it it's amazing, but not a lot of people know about it. And I was surprised that the Zoe Report uh, plucked it out kind of almost out of obscurity uh, because a lot of times these publications as great as they are they focus on what's new you know what have you launched in the last couple of months or what's coming soon and they don't necessarily always go back to some of the older products that are still great but they just they've been out for a while it's not news so that would be uh, your routine during the day. Dab that on over the top so as not to disrupt the color and then you're re-upping your SPF. At night, you could use a product like our Lip and Body Treatment Balm. Do I have that here? I feel like I always keep this one in my desk. This comes in a little pot. Um, see, I use it quite a bit. Um, I'm almost never without this. We have them scattered throughout the house, but some people also really like our hyaluronic acid plus peptide lip booster. This is a really good one to pick if you are concerned about loss of fur or um, fullness uh, because it does have some non-irritating plumping qualities. It's got this really nice smooth applicator. This has a very different feel on the lips than Lip and Body Treatment Balm. Lip and Body Treatment Balm uh, is more, it's thicker, more emollient, feels more protective. It does have those heavier emollients, some oil, some waxes in there. This is more of a, like a fluid type technology that has morphed into um, a semi-viscous gel that is not sticky, glides on, and uh, has a nice soft gloss finish. This is actually a favorite product of a lot of uh, men that work for Paula's Choice because they just, they love that it doesn't make their lips feel, uh, in their words, gloopy. And, uh, and it just keeps them hydrated for a really long time. So uh, that would be, that's the simplest thing to do, just to make sure that morning and evening you are paying attention to your lips. They absolutely need sun protection. Um, and then at night you can choose, e even if you don't want to go and buy a special lip balm, a product label lip balm. Another option would be to use plain Vaseline on your lips at night. Just slather it on there. Uh, CeraVe healing ointment is excellent for that, um, uh, as is Aquaphor original healing ointment. All of those are petrolatum based, and petrolatum is, uh, despite the bad rap it gets, uh, is being synthetic, despite the fact that it actually comes from the earth, um, is the most benign, gentle, and highly effective emollient ever discovered. Still, I mean, there isn't there isn't a, uh, a, a, a plant whose emollient properties have been shown to best petrolatum. Maybe. Maybe cocoa butter comes close, shea butter comes close, but still not as good. Um, the downside is that petrolatum doesn't have any, uh, really, it, it just, it moisturizes and helps protect. It doesn't give your skin antioxidants. It doesn't give your skin uh, replenishing ingredients. It doesn't uh, have any communication properties with skin the way our you know, retinoids and peptides do. So, but 
If the objective is to prevent dryness, to seal in water, petrolatum tops the list. Number eight, take beauty rest seriously. Most of us uh, can attest, you know, we just, you have a, a bad night's sleep or a series of nights because uh, it gets, it, the, the more nights you go without good sleep, the more it takes a toll on your mental health, your physical health, and all of that pipes into how you look. So paying attention uh, to how much rest you're getting and, and not just rest, but quality sleep is incredibly important. Uh, not just for overall health, which includes mental health and actual day-to-day -day cognitive functioning, uh, but not getting enough sleep. They've, there have been several studies that have looked at various skin parameters uh, in, in where you have a control group <clears throat> of people who are meeting certain criteria of getting a certain amount of sleep each night. They report uh, waking up feeling rested as opposed to waking up feeling like, I, I know I've been in bed for eight hours, but I may have only slept really well for two of them. Uh, and what they found is that a lack of sleep, and it gets worse the more nights of this you experience, it literally leads to a hydration imbalance. Skin starts to become impaired. It does not know how to maintain uh, that homeostasis uh, and, and move water and other substances as effectively through skin. They have actually measured reduced resiliency when they, when they pull on the skin and uh, measure how long it takes to bounce back into place. The sleep deprived group did worse there despite the fact that the subjects had were of a very similar age and similar skin condition and appearance at the start of the test. Dull complexion, uh, and an uptick in lipid peroxidation due to increased free radical damage. So what that means is that sleep deprivation literally hinders your skin's antioxidant defense system. It, it literally becomes less able to neutralize uh, the, perox the peroxyl radicals that go on to damage lipids in your skin, like sebum, like ceramides, like cholesterol, all of which are critical to having a strong, healthy barrier. So it stands to reason that another downside of not getting enough sleep in terms of how it impacts your skin is that over time, your skin is going to become more sensitive, more reactive, it's more irritable to external stimuli, all because your rest isn't sufficient enough. It also causes, I know it just gets worse, doesn't it? Sleep deprivation or even just having one bad night's sleep causes an increase in cortisol, which is the stress hormone. That's the fight or flight hormone, as it's sometimes called. When cortisol is active all the time, uh, when the body, that basically the body thinks it's constantly in a state of stress, that takes a serious toll on our health and, and looks. And you may, you may describe yourself as looking frazzled, looking, your, your face may look drawn, uh, your face may constantly be battling dehydration. You're getting uh, a splotchiness that it's not acne. It's not. Uh, it's not like a dark spot from sun damage. It's, it's just you. Your complexion, not just on your face, but on your body, the skin on the body, just starts looking blotchy. Uh, that can all be a sign of too much cortisol going on because of various stressors in your life. So, general tips for getting. A better night's rest. This is important. Um, I've been reading a really interesting book uh, lately called Outlive by Dr. Peter Atia. Uh, it's, it's all about um, the, the, I think he calls it the four horsemen uh, of health markers that um, there's significant research showing that if you can avoid these or minimize them or delay them as long as possible, things like neurodegenerative decline, cardiovascular issues, metabolic issues like diabetes, uh, and I'm talking like adult onset diabetes, which is type two, not the kind that people, some people are born with. Um, all of that is, is, uh, can help increase what's called your health span. And what that means is that you are in a better position to get older and have those older years, you know, like the last decade of life, so to speak. So for some of us, it might be our 70s. For some of us, it might be our 80s. Some of us may be lucky enough to live even longer. But the point is that you are living into your old age in reasonably good health. 
you know, you, you are, so those last years aren't, you know, you, you don't feel like you're on a, a, a precipitous decline where everything just starts breaking down. In the last five years of your life, you're just kind of miserable. You're still alive, but, you know, you've got so many issues. So it's, and so much of that is within our control. So it was, it's overall, it's a very uplifting book. And he has an entire chapter on the importance of sleep. So just really quick, some general tips. Try to make the area where you sleep as uh, dark as possible. And that does mean, and I'm guilty of this, minimizing if not completely eliminating TV before bed. Don't watch TV in bed when it is that time of day when you're intending to go to sleep. Uh, the, the bright light flickering from the TV can mess up your circadian rhythm uh, and can cause sleep disruptions. Even if you end up falling asleep in front of the TV, uh, that bright light that continues to flicker can send signals, even with your eyes closed, uh, that can confuse those circadian rhythms. So try to minimize or cut that out as much as possible. For sure, because of the distance, Looking at your tablet, looking at your phone, or looking at uh, having a laptop in bed with you where you're like this close from the screen is even worse. Even if you have the um, blue light uh, setting turned more to yellow light, so you're not getting that blue light exposure, it's the brightness. What that does is it's, it tricks your brain into thinking that it really isn't time to go to sleep. Uh, and, and so your brain stays in more of a hypervigilant wired mode because it doesn't know that it's time. Uh, and that can impact the secretion of the hormone melatonin, which is our body's wind down hormone. So darkness, keeping the room on the cool side. The ideal sleeping temperature for a bedroom is around 65 degrees. So if you're someone that likes cranking the heat up and keeping your room toasty warm, you could be doing yourself a disservice because that you'll, you'll be preventing the body's natural temperature drop at night and keeping the ambient air in a, in a, at a temperature that isn't conducive to the best rest. It's a trade-off because if you're someone that is just always cold and you know you love your electric blanket, you're getting the super thick comforter, you're sleeping with you know a t-shirt, a sweatshirt, a hood, you know, you're just you're prepping. Uh, so ways to tell though if that is backfiring is if you go to sleep like that and then you wake up two three hours later and you're sweaty and you feel like you just have to take layers off, push the covers back. That is your body telling you the temperature that I am is not conducive to healthy sleep. So the temperature of the room is big, the amount of light that gets into the room is big, and one of the other big ones is sticking with a consistent sleep-wake schedule. If you're someone whose bedtime and, er and uh, awake time tends to be really erratic, that can throw off your sleep cycle. So try to keep as consistent. I know that life happens. Sometimes you stay up late, you know, there. there it, it is going to change. So it, the, all of these tips are just try to keep it as consistent as you possibly can. Number seven, choose foods wisely. Eating healthfully and, and mindfully, at least most of the time, has a direct impact on the health and appearance of not, not just your skin, but also your nails and your hair. So we're talking a brighter complexion with healthier looking color, shiny hair, stronger nails, the Mediterranean diet is widely considered the most healthful overall, and it's hardly uh, what most people would think of as being restrictive. You get healthy fats from olive oil, uh, nuts and seeds, lean sources of protein, including fish and poultry. Uh, some red meat is allowed, but it, it's generally, uh, uh, I guess you'd say, a, a, an occasional thing as opposed to daily whole grains, uh, legumes, lentils, lots of fresh fruits and veggies, and even a glass or two of red wine. Also included in the Mediterranean style of eating would be things like Greek yogurt, part skimmed cheeses like your mozzarella, feta, goat cheese, Parmesan, and even whole grain pasta. So just from that list, you can think of all of the possible combinations and things that you could make. The other thing that the Mediterranean diet includes a lot of is various herbs and spices and seasonings that are, are infusing the foods with flavor as opposed to a ton of salt, which too much is, you know, just like too much sugar is a bad thing, too much salt, definitely a bad thing. 
But the other advantage of all of these flavoring additives, your fresh herbs and spices and things like paprika and cardamom and cumin, uh, oregano, rosemary, they're all antioxidant rich. So you're, you're adding all of this goodness to food that is already healthy and making it even better. Uh, that is not to say that you can't occasionally indulge, have the chocolate cake, you know, have the martini every now and then, you know, even have a nice fresh baked pastry for breakfast. But generally speaking, if you stick to, say, 85% of your food choices falling into that Mediterranean diet style of eating, and there's tons of research backing this up, you will be healthier overall and you will see the difference in your skin, in your hair, in your nails. Number six, back to skincare as far as product related, experiment to find your ideal routine. Don't get hung up on needing all of your products to come from the same brand or even from the same line within that brand. And by experiment, I mean not just experiment with individual products, but experiment with which textures experiment to find out which textures you prefer and then, uh, and note how they layer with other products in your routine. Are all of the products that you're using uh, compatible in terms of how well they layer with each other? Because there are some various products and formulations that uh, play against each other. And when you uh, experience that, you might uh, find that the products um, pill, kind of ball up and roll on the skin. Uh, so it's this is all part of uh, that, that experimentation to find out how's the compatibility, how do you personally feel about how the products are, are going on your skin, is it the right texture and finish for your skin type, uh, does it work well under makeup, and is the combination of products you're using, is it making a difference that's positive? Or is it going more towards negative? You, you, know, you know these ingredients are good for skin, for example, but you're not getting the results you were hoping for. You may even be getting uh, irritants, irritancy. So experimenting also involves um, playing around with frequency of use to see which cadence works best for you. And knowing that even when you find the ideal balance, skin can throw you a curveball and you may need to start things, uh, step things up again. So as an example, um, some people find that seasonal changes necessitate a, a switching of products or, for example, if you live in an environment <clears throat> where during the winter months the humidity gets very low, the indoor air gets very dry, your regular moisturizer may not be cutting it, but you don't want to necessarily give up that moisturizer. So you may need to weave in uh, an additional product to layer on top of that moisturizer at night. Maybe it's something like a, a sleeping mask. Maybe it is a, a, a richer moisturizer that you just use during the, those times when your skin is feeling extra dry and tight and your usual moisturizer isn't relieving that feeling. Number five exfoliate on a regular basis but not with a scrub which is mostly just good for extra cleansing the difference that a leave-on alpha hydroxy acid aha beta hydroxy acid bha or polyhydroxy acid pha can make it really cannot be overstated particularly if you haven't used such products before it's the most this group of products these leave on exfoliants is the most game changing step in your routine because they can address so many concerns that most of us either have or will have dullness uneven tone irregular bumpy texture clogged pores redness discolorations fine lines wrinkles, even barrier damage. Yes, these leave-on exfoliants, when they're well formulated, can actually be good for your skin's barrier, even if you use them twice a day. However, when you're new to a leave-on acid-based exfoliant, the general advice is to start slowly to see how your skin responds. So don't, you know, approach this step with all bells ringing and, you know, start bathing in this stuff just start slow apply maybe once every uh once per day every three days note how your skin responds and then you fairly quickly if you're seeing a great response you can you can step up 
the frequency of use till you get up to once or twice for some concerns and skin types uh, daily application. But um, the other thing that you can do with this step um, that I have personally found helpful over the years is I alternate. So for example, here's the resist daily smoothing treatment with 5% AHA. This is one of my long-standing favorites. In the AHA exfoliant group, I also use our Calm 1% Sensitive Skin Exfoliant, which is a, a, a BH 1% BHA lotion. Love the texture of that. That product was recently reformulated. It has an all new suite of soothing ingredients in there. So I love it for that. Um, but the point is, I think a lot of people, because of the different mechanisms of actions of the various hydroxy acids and the often um, overlapping concerns that we have that combination, you don't have to apply them both at once, I'm talking about going back and forth, but that combination can really uh, hit more targets and get your skin uh, to an even better state. Number four, align yourself with a trusted dermatologist, but not just for things like Botox. Very simple to go to a, a cosmetic dermatologist and talk about things like you know, in, uh, Botox injections, dermal fillers, facial peels, uh, and the like. And I'm absolutely not um, downgrading those services, those procedures. What I'm getting at though, is that the skin is the, the largest organ of our body. And just like you have specialist physicians for things like cardiac health and eye health, we should also have a specialist that we see routinely, a dermatologist, to assess the overall health of our skin. At the very least, even if you're looking at yourself from head to toe and thinking, from a medical perspective, I don't think I have any problems, everything seems to be just fine, great. Particularly if you're older, if you're, if you're approaching 50, Establish a relationship with a dermatologist in, dermatologist in your area to establish uh, and, and, and what you want to do is get a baseline. You go in for a full body uh, skin cancer check, have any uh, marks and, and issues uh, on your body examined by this, uh, by this medical professional and then they can note uh, the condition in certain areas and then you can track how that changes over the years. You know, uh, some dermatologists get very sophisticated with various apps and cameras and they can photograph certain things that may, uh, you know how sometimes you go to the dentist and they say, oh, there's a little something on that tooth, we're going to watch that. No, no action needed right now, it's a watch and wait. Same thing in dermatology. They may see something that they're not concerned about right now in the moment, but five years later, this could turn into something that would be concerning. And that now, now we have this record to look back at and say, ah, here's where we started, here's where we are now. Because if you're not monitoring that super closely, and particularly if it's on a harder to reach or harder to see area like your backside, um, or like, for example, uh, in the armpit or under the breast or something like that, where it's not staring you in the face all the time, you're probably not going to remember if and when that changed without that historical um, photographic documentation. So it's just a good idea, you're, you know, you're, and your dermatologist is also an excellent resource for any type of skin disorder. Um, honestly, most of them are going to know far more about things like acne, rosacea, eczema, psoriasis, uh, fungal infections, and things of that nature than they would about a cosmetic formula. You know, than they would about what makes a great moisturizer or what's the best anti-aging product out there. There are, of course, many dermatologists out there that are immersed in the skincare world and, and can talk shop about that all day long, but when it comes to what they went to school for, what they got their degrees and are, and are credentialed for. It is, a, it is skin disorders and diseases. It is things of a medical nature more so than a cosmetic nature. If you need help finding a dermatologist in your area, you can ask your primary care provider for a referral. 
You can use the Physician Finder feature on your insurance provider's um, website. Uh, or in the United States, you can check, go to aad.org. That is the American Academy of Dermatology's website, and they have something right on the home page. I think it's in the upper right um, navigation that says find a dermatologist, and it works very well. And now you may not find a dermatologist, depending in what part of the country you live in, there may not be one right around the corner, uh, but I think you can narrow down the search to if, you know 50 miles, 25 miles. You can expand it that way if, if not enough options or no options are coming up that close to home. Number three, a non-fragrant facial oil blend can be a skin saver. I always keep um, this one, our Moisture Renewal Oil Booster, in-house since it's so amazing to augment the emolliency of my facial serums or non-SPF moisturizer. So that example I was giving a moment ago about choosing a richer product or layering products during times of year when your regular moisturizer isn't cutting it because it's just so much more drier in the ambient air, this can be wonderful to add to such a product. You can also use it on its own. Uh, you can use it as a spot treatment on dry patches, dry flaky patches. I also will sometimes add this to stronger products like retinoids uh, to increase tolerability. And to some extent, it kind of works as a buffer to help slow penetration of that active ingredient a bit into the skin. Now you can do this exact same thing with a single non-fragrant plant oil such as jojoba or argan or even coconut oil. But a blend of oils is going to be multi-beneficial because then you're exposing your skin to the unique profiles of essential fatty acids that are in all the various oils as well as their unique antioxidant properties. So that is, um, that is my uh, advice on why a multi-oil blend is better than just using a single oil. But in a pinch, if you happen to have something like plain jojoba oil around the house, give it a go and, and see how it works for you. Number two, when it comes to skincare, don't forget your neck and chest. Skin in these areas is highly vulnerable to UV and other types of environmental damage, uh, to some degree even more so than the face. All of the ingredients proven to benefit facial skin are gonna help the neck and the chest too, so there's no need to purchase products for these specific areas. Uh, at the very least, apply SPF to your neck, and if your the clothing you wear, if the top you wear exposes the uh, decolle decollete area, uh, AKA the chest, um, a leave-on exfoliant and a firming serum can work wonders in those areas too to help improve um, the loss of firmness, to help improve and smooth uh, the texture when things start getting a bit crepe-like. If you are uh, in one of the stages of menopause, you are struggling uh, and you're not on some sort of hormone replacement therapy, you are going to be start seeing signs of what is called estrogen deficient skin. And one of the changes that is observed is the skin, it becomes thinner and takes on a more crepe-like texture. For that concern, uh, topical phytoestrogen ingredients, those um, antioxidants derived from soy, Equal, Daidezine, Genestine, they can be, resveratrol is another one, they can be remarkable at helping to improve the texture, the tone, and, and the, the firmness and resiliency of that area so you don't have to live with that crepey texture that you don't like. Okay, uh, one comment. One more note, because skin on the neck is thinner than facial skin, it can be more sensitive to bioactive ingredients. So for example, if your facial skin loves 1% retinol, your neck skin may not, and ditto for high strengths of vitamin C. It isn't that you can't use those strong, uh, stronger ingredients on the neck or on the chest, but you may want to start more slowly, move more cautiously in those areas, or even consider starting with a lower strength of those ingredients. So, for example, lots of examples today. Instead of 15% uh, vitamin C that you'd find in our C15 Super Booster, and you may love that for your face, 
But for the neck, you may do better using the C5 uh, Super Boost Moisturizer, which of course you can also put on your face. Last but not least, drum roll please. The number one underrated skincare tip is, say it with me, broad spectrum sunscreen applied to all areas of exposed skin, especially the face, the eye area, the neck, every day, year round, no exceptions. I've, I've heard all kinds of excuses for why people don't want to do it. Sunscreens are getting better and better from a sensory or aesthetic perspective. You absolutely, there is, I promise you, there is a sunscreen out there that you will want to use, that you will look forward to putting on. Uh, you, you Again, going back to that experimentation tip, it may take you a little bit of uh, time and trouble to find it, but it is worth it because every, so much, of what changes about our skin over time, what we end up not liking about our skin as we get older, is all traced back either directly or indirectly to UV light damage, uh, to some extent visible or blue light damage, which sunscreens loaded with great antioxidants can help defend uh, skin against some of the changes that will uh, that would normally occur because of that type of exposure. But far and away, it literally is the best thing you can do. It is not a sexy topic, uh, but it is so foundational to great skincare um, and, and, and such an underrated tip because I still talk with people, even though they know what I do for a living, and, you know, they'll be almost like, uh, almost like somebody who's like still goes out and sneaks a cigarette every now and then, but nobody really knows that they smoke. They'll be like, "Well, I, you know, I'm using this product and using that product, and well, I, I don't always put sunscreen on. Like, you know, I know I should, but do it, do it. Nothing else is going to matter as much for your skin if you're not protecting it from ongoing environmental damage." Um, oh, one more bonus tip. This came up in a meeting today. Um, this is a long time uh, favorite, <clears throat> the Skin Recovery Hydrating Treatment Mask. It is um, <clears throat> designed for use on the face, for normal to dry skin. Super moisturizing mask. The blend uh, and the balance of emollients, uh, which help uh, prevent water loss, and humectants, which help draw uh, water and, and hold it there, you know, those hy hydroscopic ingredients uh, in the uppermost layers of skin. It's just this really nice balance. I just found out this is uh, a favorite for people who get dry, itchy arm and leg skin in the winter to use. Uh, my, uh, my colleague mentioned that she's sold this to so many people. Uh, I guess you'd kind of say it's an off-label use, uh, and they won't go back to any other moisturizer during those times of year when their skin just gets super scaly and dry. So, um, I guess that tip would fall under the under the naming of um, uh, don't. You don't always have to use a skincare product precisely for where it was intended to be used. You can experiment and like, for example, the lip and body treatment balm, you can apply that around your eyes if you want to, you know, a nice eye balm. Uh, if your eye area skin is getting extra dry and flaky, you can totally apply it there. All right, we've got some questions here. Christopher, we've got about 15 minutes left. Brian, do you guys share information like UVA PF values of your new Advanced Sun Protection Daily Moisturizer SPF 50 Plus? It's not something the EU team have really touched on. No, it's an EU launch. We did the, um, I don't think we did that test, Christopher, which is why they're not, they're not sharing it. We did the PA testing. I think that is a test that we are looking into doing for that particular formula, but I'm not 100% sure. Uh, Angie, do, does the cleansing balm have flax in it? I have a flax allergy. True. I don't think it, I don't think it does. Uh, look at the ingredient list. It's got the olive oil, pexamine esters. It has the meadow foam seed oil, jojoba seed oil, and rapeseed oil, which is saddled with a horrible name, um, more commonly known as canola oil. So no, I think it's, uh, accurate to say that that is flax free. Allie, my coworker, I'll always have my lip and body balm on my nightstand. I keep mine in my drawer, Allie. But yeah, it's, seriously, I, I have this stuff squirreled all over the house um, because I never want to be too far away from it. 
Mrs. Flory, hello, it's winter and dark when I get back from work. I do my evening routine, but then end up going back out without makeup. Don't need to wash my face again when I get back because of pollution. I guess, I mean, it wouldn't hurt. Um, but unless you live in a, a, a heavily polluted area, I wouldn't worry too much about it. Um, yeah, I wouldn't worry too much about it. If, if there's a way, I'm trying to, uh, going back without, back out without makeup, I don't wash my face again. Oh, I mean, if you're out for a long period of time, uh, and, and you, you know, and you're going into a, a more urban environment, or you live in a more urban environment, I don't think it's a bad idea at all. But if you, you know, don't want to be a stickler for it, then I, I understand that too. And then do I have any ideas on the new Calm SPF will come out? Uh, the the uh, SPF that we developed for the Calm line, I believe is going to launch early 2024. Um, but I, uh, I think that we're still firming up that official launch date. But it, it, is, it is a go. The Calm collection will have an all new SPF, which we're super excited about. Angie, which exfoliant is generally best for dry, sensitive, rosaceous skin, AHA or BHA? Generally BHA, and the reason for that is because salicylic acid uh, is related to acetyl salicylic acid, otherwise known as aspirin. And as such, salicylic acid retains the um, soothing or anti-inflammatory properties that aspirin has. Uh, however, that is the general rule or guideline. Um, you may find that your rosacea doesn't like salicylic acid, in which case uh, I would, in terms of AHAs, I would look for mandelic acid um, because it's widely considered the gentlest AHA. It's, um, uh, the Ordinary has a pretty good uh, mandelic acid product. It's kind of basic, but you're getting the mandelic acid, which is good. Uh, the other one to look for if you have rosacea and your skin doesn't like or doesn't respond favorably to salicylic acid is polyhydroxy acids such as gluconolactone or lactobionic acid. Those are also on the gentler side in the world of acids. Uh, and definitely gentler than say glycolic acid when rosacea is the concern. Carolyn, I know not to use I know not to use under the eyes with retinol type products. However, on the side of the eyes, crow's feet with a with a skinema, okay. Yeah, totally. You can dab it. I mean, you can use a retinol product um, along the orbital bone area, this, this, the eye socket, the underside of the eye socket, and then out here too. That's that's fine. It will warm with your body heat and migrate upwards a bit. The the thing is, you just don't want to get products like that in the eye itself. Um, this may be something too where you need to experiment with using a lower strength retinol product in the eye area, but that's that's highly individual. Um, I use uh, my current retinoid from Paula's Choice is the Triple Active Total Repair Serum. Um, if you haven't tried that yet, stop watching this chat, go buy it, it's fantastic. Um, that's the, That has a, uh, a retinol derivative called retinol propionate, uh, which has a different onset of action um, it's just, it's a, it's a bit gentler, most people will experience, than pure retinol. Pure retinol is great, not everybody can tolerate it, and the eye area tends to be extra sensitive, so, but personally, with that particular serum, I found that I can use it around my eyes twice a day sometimes, uh, with no issues, and I layer that with the C5 Super Boost eye cream, so I'm putting the 5% vitamin C around my eyes as well, going all in. Okay, uh, da, 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 da. Um, Carolyn, Carolyn, we're not, calm down, we're not ignoring questions. I, I, as, as you were told, I get to questions at the end of the topic. Uh, okay, never without my SPF during the day. Good on you, Angie, and okay, cool. And then one last question here from Andrea. Hi, Brian, with Autumn just around the corner. I'm hoping you might consider an episode about ingredients that are best for dry, chapped hands, cuticles, and feet in the cold weather months. That is an excellent idea. Um, you know, even in even in the, the, the summer months, you know, when you're in a warmer climate, 
when you are, uh, or a lot of people, myself included, um, I like being barefoot. I barely wear socks at all during June, July, and August here uh, in Michigan because I, you know, sandals, why bother with socks, and my feet definitely take a beating. Uh, I have to absolutely pay a lot more attention to them. Um, all kinds of maintenance. I don't really go for pedicures. I probably should. Um, that that would be a whole other topic. But anyway, so yes, we will uh, we will look at doing uh, maybe like a, a winter skin saver or a cold weather skin saver show with emphasis on hands, feet. Pretty much everything I said about lips earlier in the show would apply uh, during any time of year. It's just that during the colder, drier months, you may need to um, uh, increase the frequency of um, the amount of times in a given day you're putting your balms on because you just need that layer constantly there because the air is so dry, you know, um, versus like in a humid summer. So, all right, great idea, and thank you all for, for your questions and for hanging with me as I get through that list of top 10. And we will be back next uh, month, September. Oh my gosh, where is this year gone? With an all-new show. Thanks again.